So what does sleeping with monks, but also owning the Atlanta Hawks, doing some Zico water and Marquee Jet have in common? Well, you're about to find out here in this session with Jesse Itzler. Jesse is here today to talk about his entrepreneurial journey, going all the way through his Marquee Jet growth and what he built there, the largest private jet car company that sold to Berkshire Hathaway. I love the part where he bought as many muffins as he could to start his business. Then went into Zico, then also lived with the SEAL David Goggins, then also got into Zico, and then lived with some monks, which brings us an entire another world to talk about. So please welcome Jesse Itzler. Jesse, welcome. How you guys doing, man? Everything good? Amazing. Great. See if you guys can see me. The big thing is, can you hear us? We I got your buddy you. here, Eric Matisic there. I got to hear some stories about how you two got together because that, that I know you guys are having fun. <laughs> yeah. Can you? Okay, here we go. Can you guys see me and hear me? Yep. All right. We're up. Good to see you guys, man. Thanks for having me. You can Thank hear you. Eric, right? Yeah, Eric, you're a little bit low, but... Uh, but I can, I can sort it out. All right. Well, we can pass the mic back and forth as well. Well, Jesse, man, while you're here, I mean, this, this to me, after learning about you, is, is almost the most, you know, easiest thing to talk about, your journey coming here uh, and, and being a startup and, and an entrepreneur. But talk about real quick the backstory of how you became an entrepreneur. Well, certainly. First of all, thank you guys for having me. Uh, I'm in Atlanta. And this is just cool that a human being invented this, that you guys can be wherever you are. People are all over the world. I'm in the chat room looking at people from not just obviously Denver, but from Thailand. And it's just great that we're all communicating. I only have one agenda today, and that's to provide value to everybody. So um, as an entrepreneur, I've always really tried to, not just as an entrepreneur, as a dad, as a husband, as a son, as a friend, try to over index in value. And if you do that, good things usually happen. But to answer your question, uh, I've had a very unconventional journey as an entrepreneur. I guess I'm pro my biggest success was I started a, a private jet company with my partner called Marquee Jet. We started it with no aviation experience, no money, no airplanes. And we grew it to $5 billion in sales fairly quickly and sold it to Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway. Before that, just a couple of years before that, I was sleeping on my friend's couch. I slept on 18 different couches between the ages of 19 to 22, friends that put me up as I was doing different jobs. Um, I was a kiddie pool attendant. I wrote jingles. I sold carrot and celery sticks door to door. I tried to be a, a t-shirt salesman. And literally four years after all that crazy, not crazy stuff, I started a private jet company. So for anybody listening, just know that you're only one idea away from changing the trajectory of your life. And that's what happened to me. But throughout all those different things, and I've done a lot of different things. I was in the coconut water business and I wrote a book and I've had multiple businesses, some worked, some didn't. Uh, but the themes have always been the same. And uh, those themes have always been that I've had no prior experience in anything that I've done. And for me, experience is a little bit overrated. It's great. I'm not belittling experience, but it takes a long time. And I've always been operated from a place of, let me get my foot in the door. Let me start the process and figure it out more as, as I go along. And, um, and I've always put soul into everything I've done. Don't underestimate soul. I've always cared the most about my products, about my customers, uh, about um, – the, the branding, the look, I never took shortcuts on any of that stuff. And I've always felt that the companies that are built on because they want people wanted to make money or whatever, don't have the same longevity, um, amazing products uh, than the companies that were built on love and caring. And I really cared about everything that I've done and still do. So those themes never, never really deviate. Um, have never deviated along my journey. So Jesse, this is Eric. Uh, so great to see you. And uh, we got a chance to meet back in 2004. Uh, I remember you running into a conference room at Marquee Jet, tons of energy, uh, always that heart and soul of that business. 
And I remember, you know, hearing that you were a rapper. Um, you had created some pretty impressive jingles, uh, one for the NBA, which we'd love to hear about. But I'd love for you to take us back to that first pitch. Uh, well, I think his name was Rich Santuli. Uh, when you and Kenny started to get Marquee off the ground, did it go easy? Uh, wh what happened? Um, well, let me just let me take it even back further. I, I love face to face meetings because I'm going to teach everybody how to dominate a meeting in, in 30 seconds or less. And then I'll answer Ooh. your question. Um, no, I really believe that. I feel like I can take control of a meeting in the first 30 seconds of a meeting without the other person even knowing that the, the power has been shifted. I'll share it with you very quickly because you're, you're bringing you're, you're taking me back to that moment as a 27 year old kid walking into a meeting with guys in suits. I looked insane, young, <laughs> didn't know anything. And how do I, how am I going to be? And know that I have very little time and I have an idea that they could probably do without me. So when I go into a meeting, the first thing that I do is I stand up. I'm not low energy. I don't want to get up and have to fix my suit. And pile, I'm standing up. I'm ready to go into the meeting. And before the meeting even starts, I might walk in and say, um, hey, Eric, cra crazy. Um, last night I had a crazy night before we even start. My parents are here. My parents are, are 90 years old. My dad was getting ready and I, you know, I took his shoes off. I had to help him get ready for bed. And he's a little bit elderly. I've been taking care of him. And I just had a long night with him, making sure everything was okay. But I'm so happy to be here and meet you today. Now, in those 15 seconds, I already told you everything you need to know about me. I'm loyal. I'm a family person. My priorities are right. Probably someone you're going to trust, someone I want to be in business with. You didn't even know that I flipped the whole meeting. And I've already established the credibility with you. So now instead of you asking me questions and me being defensive, I've played offense without you even knowing. So I walk into this room as a 28-year-old kid with an idea to start a private jet company with no airplanes. They have the largest fleet of airplanes in the world, 650 airplanes, a multi-billion dollar company. And we're going to go pitch the idea. And we pitched this idea for a private jet card company, which was our idea, to buy 25 hours of jet time instead of a whole airplane. And you could prepay it. You paid 100 grand for 25 hours. It works like a debit card. You fly two hours on your airplane. It's ready on six hour notice. And now you have 23 hours left. You fly an hour, you have 22 hours left. Anyway, we got thrown out of the pitch in 12 minutes. And the guy, the direct quote from the CEO was, if you think I'm giving two guys who probably didn't break a thousand on their SAT access to my thousand planes because we needed their airplanes for our business, he goes, it's not happening. But anyway, we were able to get a meeting back there a week or two later. The, one of the guys saw something in us and we realized we could never sell our idea in a PowerPoint, in a, which we had. We had to bring it to life. So we brought in our own focus group. We brought in a focus group. One by one, eight people came into the meeting. We set up a table and one by one, they stood up and they explained why they would never buy a fraction of a plane, which is what NetJets was selling in the meeting, but they would buy a 25-hour jet card. So we actually... We did three things in that meeting very quickly. One is we did something completely different than anything he's ever seen before. We brought in our own focus group. Two, we were super confident that like, you know, we could get this done. We showed, you know, a little bit what they call chutzpah, like, you know, thinking out of the box and moxie, whatever you want to call it. And, the, and we walked away with the deal. A year later, we were doing $150 million in sales. Well, let's talk about those sales, because one of the things you said, you mentioned it earlier, stick to the process, don't cut corners. You got that meeting with, with NetJets, but then you actually went out for your first sale, bought every single muffin in a coffee store. Talk about how that relates to sticking it out, not cutting corners and being a risk taker, not a thrill seeker. Yeah. I mean, as an entrepreneur, one of the, my big kind of mantras is I don't negotiate my goals. So I always wow. go to the end of the movie whatever that goal is, and the script might change, the plot, how I get there might change, but the goal is unwavering. I went to get my first sale. I went to a place, to the, actually to the TED conference in Monterey, California, when I, was, I flew out there because I had no way of getting leads at the time. There was no internet. There was no DMing. Like If you wanted to sell somebody, you had to show up, introduce yourself, and pitch them. So I, I flew out to Monterey, California because I heard there were qualified buyers but I didn't have a credential to get into the TED talk. So I was at a coffee shop and um, I noticed just thinking like, I just flew 16 hours, two connecting flights. How am I going to leave here with the sale? That's my goal. I'm not negotiating it. 
And I noticed every two hours, people with credentials would walk in on a coffee break. So the next morning I woke up and they were all buying lattes and muffins. Everybody muffins, muffins, muffins. I woke up in the morning, went to the coffee shop and I bought all the muffins. So when the first break came and the wave of people walked in and the guy wanted to order a muffin, the lady behind the counter was like, I'm sorry, but they're, we're out of muffins. And on the way out, I stopped them. I said, I'm sorry, sir. I heard you ordering a muffin. I actually have an extra one if you want one. And we started talking. He goes, well, what do you do? I said, I have a private jet company. He said, get out of here. I'm actually in the market for a private jet. Do you mind if we sit down, if I talk about it? And he would became my first sale. And you know that wasn't in my business plan, guys. Like fly 16 hours, go to a coffee shop and try to make a sale. Um, but the reality is you're the business plan. Yeah. You are the, if you're a startup, you know, and, and you're an entrepreneur, like you're the business plan. People are betting on you and you have to make it happen no matter what. If that means flying 18 hours, being in a coffee shop, whatever it is. And, and once I got the first sale, that's when the work began. Over service them, make them feel like the only customer, make them feel like he'll never want, he never wants to leave me because I care the most, which anyone can do, and then get a referral. And that's what I did over and over and over until we got to $5 billion in sales. It didn't happen without, you know, being super present and, and really being part of the process. And selling to Warren Buffett, let, let's put a cherry on this deal. <laughs> yeah. That was fun, but you know, the, the most interesting, the best part, the greatest gift that Marquee Jet gave me wasn't the wire, the money that hit the bank account, that was amazing. The best gift that Marquee Jet gave me was as a 29, 30 year old kid, we flew the who's who of pop culture, athletes, entertainers, and I was obsessed with their daily habits. So as mm -hmm. a 30 year old, being around these entrepreneurs and thought leaders and getting an opportunity to ask them, you know, how do you, how do you, what's, what time do you get up? What do you do with your money? How do you live rich? What does your day look like? I was obsessed with their habits. My life today is a compilation of, the great habits that these people told me about that I've tried, some stuck, some didn't, but we're really just a product of our root habits and routines. So for anyone that has a startup, starting out in business, just getting started, your daily routines are so important. So Jesse, I remember walking into 840 Park once where the Marquee Jet office was lo located. And when I walked in, they're like, Jesse's set up a new shop down the hall. And I walked in and there's a bunch of branded logos on the ceiling. It was like pure chaos. Tell us about Zico and how within that brand chaos, you identified yet another trend uh, to ultimately sell a business to Coca-Cola. Yeah, I'm happy to. I'm, I'm just seeing in the chat room, I'll answer it in one second. People are talking about the habits. You know, we, we talk about, everybody talks about the importance of a morning habit and routine, and that is important, but I'm a much bigger believer in evening routines because my day starts the night before. Mm -hmm. I don't just wake up and wing it. Like, what am I gonna do today? The competition's too good. I take time the night before and I map out exactly, you can even see it on my board over here. I map out exactly what my day looks like and I just follow the script. Back to your question about Marquee Jet and, and Zico. Um, look, as an entrepreneur, it's important to think about what makes your product different. How is it different than anything else in the marketplace? And I'm a runner. I discovered coconut water during a hundred mile run that I was training for. And I finished the run uh, powered by coconut water and said, well, when people discover the miracle of this, what I just experienced, it's going to be the next big thing in beverage. And um, so that's how I kind of discovered the, the product, just doing a lot of research around hydration and nutrition training for my hundred mile run and um, ended up falling in love with the category and then partnering with a, a small, tiny company called Zico that we sold to Coca-Cola two years later. And well, thank you because I love the coconut water. It helps save lives. Now you talk about that process, Jesse, what role does the calendar play in your process? I, I map things out, man. I, 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 um, I like to play offense in my life. I think Me most too. people, <laughs> I know. <laughs> most people play defense though. Their calendar fills up with meetings and appointments and they get overscheduled and phone calls and it leaves very little time for the things that they wanna do. And I found that if you don't plan for stuff that you wanna do in your life and prioritize yourself, 
you're going to be playing defense and filling up your calendar with other people's requests. So I map out my entire year in advance. I have this big calendar. Um, I teach people how to do it, but that, and, and I map out my whole year and I follow the script, my races, my business goals, the books I'm going to read date night with my wife visits with my parents. And it's been super, it's really been life changing for me because it's allowed me to really have 15 out of 10 years, as opposed to just living in routine, right. you know, and work, 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 work. Then you wake up and you're 70, you're overweight and you're like, where my life go, you know? So I think it's really important to, uh, to play offense, man, and do things that you like to do every day. Uh, and you've talked about one of those things being, you don't think people make enough time for thinking, you know, that's a big part of it too. What, what happens when people have the time to think? What has happened in your life when you've just had the time to think and do the things you like? Yeah, I mean, I think the only way that you can be in tune with your gut is by spending time alone. And now we don't really think. We have Alexa, we have Siri, we have all these different things off Alexa. Uh, we have all these different things that we you know, rely on to think for us. And before there was marketing, there was something called common sense. <laughs> and we've lost a lot of our common sense because we're bombarded with advertisements. And really, honestly, um, especially when we're starting out in business, we ask people their opinions because we seek validation. And we get influenced and influenced. And I think, you know, I've always relied on my gut. Like I said, I got a 980 on my SAT. And the only way for me to trust that is to spend some time alone. Doesn't mean you got to go in the mountains and pray on a carpet in the middle of the Himalayas. You just have to carve out a little bit of time. For me, that's always been running, but I always get my alone time. Jesse, you mentioned some of your habits uh, as a mosaic of all the amazing people that you've met. Um, when you think about your success um, and you think about those uh, amazing humans you've had been able to engage with, you know, you've always been a man with a heart for relationships. Talk to us a little bit about the habits around building incredible relationships that fuel your businesses. Yes. So when I started out, when I was 21 years old, 22, just getting off those couches I mentioned, uh, my marketing strategy was simple. I had no money. So <laughs> I wrote... <laughs> I had to figure it out. Um, and I wrote 10 handwritten letters a day, every day, consistently. So I sent over 3,000 handwritten letters when I was 22 years old to CEOs, everybody, anyone that impacted me, influenced me. I was planting seeds. That spirit of staying connected and casting a, wheel, a really wide net has never left me in my journey. I'm 52 years old and I still have a list of 50 people I email, DM, text, annually, I send at least three to five. How about this, guys? If you send three texts a day or DMs or emails to prospects, to um, wh whoever could advance your business, just in the next 30 days, you will plant 100 seeds. If you do 10 a day for a year, you'll plant 3,000 seeds. So my method, it's not genius. It's not um, a great marketer. I'm one word. I'm consistent. Mm. I'm consistent, man. I do three to 10 text DMs, letters every day, and I'm ahead of everybody by the end of the year. So that could be a letter to a customer, a thank you note after this interview. Hey guys, thank you so much for con considering me for this amazing, you know, seminar you guys are doing for startup week. You know, everybody gets one and I'm really consistent with it. And it's never, it's never deviated. When you're tw the people you grow up with in your twenties, are all, everyone's coming up together. But then in the 30s or 40s, some of those people are gonna be in positions of power and you never know who. When mm -hmm. I started out, Adam Silver, I was writing songs for NBA teams and Adam Silver just started working at the NBA. Now he's the commissioner. I'm a minority owner of a team. We had a cross, he had to, he had to stamp that approval on my application. I didn't know 20, 30 years ago that this would be the case, but we, <laughs> you know, you treat everybody, janitor to CEO the same, and you continue to build your network. Let's talk about fear and overcoming fear. A lot of people, especially in the startup world, is, is my product enough? Is my plan enough? Is my idea enough? How have you overcome fear in your life or worked with it to still achieve your goals that you don't negotiate? Yeah, I think the greatest enemy to success is self-doubt. And all the things that you're talking about, I'm not good enough. I don't have what it takes. The competition's too good. I don't have enough experience. 
in every, I think no matter who you are in part of your journey, even if you're a professional athlete and you're going through the process, there's periods of doubt. I assume many people have like if, if they belong or not. 100%. And yeah. And I think, you know, I combat it in a couple of ways. One is preparation. If I feel like I put the time and work in and I've got, you know, given it my all, it takes the fear out of it because there's only two outcomes, success or I tried as hard as I can and it didn't work. Either of them is acceptable, right? Mm -hmm. But like not giving it your all, then you're going to have, that's going to be fear and regret. Two is I'm aware of my own mortality. Like I realize that nobody on the planet is going to be here in a hundred years. There'll be a new wave of humans. So when I think about that, I'm like, well, why wouldn't I try? And then three is I go back, I go, I fast forward five years, you know, 10 years, even down to on 80 years old. And I think back and say like, you know, will I remember this in 10 years while I regret not trying it? Will I regret when I'm 80 that I didn't do this? And, and I practice overcoming fear. You know, I, 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 when something happens, I intentionally try to do it if it's scary. And that might sound ridiculous. That might be as simple as jumping in a cold plunge mm. or a cold lake. You know, it might be as simple as stay, you know, um, going for a run that I didn't think I could do anything. Because once you exercise that, fear muscle, that grit muscle. They say grit is the number one indicator of future success. So if we were all a little grittier, if we raised grittier kids, there's a much better chance that we'd all be more successful. The way you build grit is doing things that you don't want to do. And so it's something that I try to you know, prioritize in my life. So when you talk about doing things you didn't want to do, I uh, remember hearing a Joe Rogan podcast uh, about living with the monks. And you said, you know, on day one, maybe day five, you couldn't believe that you're going to have to be there for 15 days. <laughs> Tell us what you learned about that experience. Like what were the big takeaways to your life with living with monks? And more importantly, how did you push yourself after a 24 hour experience and said you wanted to go home? Yeah. I mean, for starters, for those that don't know, I lived on a monastery with eight monks that have been there for 50 years. And the reason why I was there is I realized I had invested so much in the physical side of my life, trainers, running races, but I really neglected the spiritual side. And as an entrepreneur, one of the most important things you can do is you try to figure out how to get from point A to point B the fastest. Like, how do I speed up the process? So when I thought about like, well, how do I become better spiritually, more spiritually, um, everything pointed to the monks. So I'm like, I'm gonna go live on a monastery. So I went there and, you know, I think the biggest takeaway for me, we could spend a lot of time on it, but the abbreviated version was I, I'm all over the place and I'm, I, I've never really been super present. And when I left them, you know, if I'm at a, I, I'm, I got 9,000 things on my to-do list. I'm juggling eight things like everybody else. I feel overwhelmed every day. I have four kids under 11. I have businesses. I have a wife. The, the number one takeaway from me was to be where your feet are. So if I'm right here in this interview, I'm here in the interview. When we hang up and it's time to go and I have to be with my kids, I'm gonna be with my kids when it's work time. It's work time, man. It's not, that, that's my time for work. So I've really gotten really good at compartmentalizing, you know, being where my feet are and just working on what it, whatever it is that I'm doing in that moment. Well, that's that's what I loved about the NFL, Jesse. No kids are allowed in between the white lines there. My kids and YA love you guys, but I got to work. And now, in, right. compartment, in compartmentalizing, you've also been able to communicate to people who are clearly different than you, who haven't seeked, you know, the, the, the opportunity, who have not jumped into a cold lake with a Navy SEAL or done 100 push-ups after they thought they were done. How do you communicate effectively to people who are so differently than you, who live so differently than you, but people you need to be successful? I think one, just by example, I try to practice, you know, I'm not, I am talking about principles that I've experienced, not that I've read about, that I've gone through. I'm battle tested in business in the sense of I've bootstrapped it. I've raised money. I've had businesses that work and haven't worked. I've had to make payroll. I've been able to make pay payroll, all those emotions. I know, I know what it feels like to be a 21 year old entrepreneur with, without clarity and fear and being scared. I know all that. So I can talk about it. Um, but at the same time, I, you know, I just try to share my best practices, what's worked and what hasn't worked because I think throughout 
most people, the journey might be different. I might sell a widget. You might be selling this pen. We have different businesses, but it all comes down to having a passion for the process, not for my widget, not for my pen, but for the, the, the passion for being an entrepreneur. That means the good, the bad, and the ugly. That's what you signed up for. So when your friends are at happy hour and everybody wants to go to happy hour, but you have a deadline and you can't go to happy hour, you got to realize, man, that's what I signed up for. And if you're not willing to do that, then you shouldn't be an entrepreneur. And so just sharing the, I've had those nights, many nights like that, many trips that I couldn't take, but it's led me to trips that I can take whenever I want to take. So, you know, just sharing all that um, as best I can. The more you experience, the more you have to offer. So um, I'm loaded, in, I've, I've over-indexed in the experience category in my life and I continue to try to do that. So then it would be, it would almost, I almost feel like it would be criminal to not share as much of that as I could. If I live on a monastery and invest 15 days of my life, man, um, how could I not? No, I don't expect anybody here listening to go live on a monastery. But why can't I give them the, you know, he or she the highlights to my takeaways and maybe they can incorporate it into their life? I'm not selfish with my advice. I don't hoard my advice. You know, I'm past that in my life, man. If, if it, I get way more enjoyment sharing it and getting people in the chat room like, man, that was really helpful than keeping it, anything in my head or, you know, or anything like that. So Jesse, through your work now, uh, it's obvious that you're giving back a tremendous amount. Tell us about uh, building your life's resume and 30 days of excellence. Like w what's, what's inside of those and, and how'd you come up with them? Well, you know, I, I never really, I've never had a resume. I don't really believe in traditional resumes in the sense, in the resumes in the sense of traditional resumes. Um, I really am a big believer in building your life resume and experiencing more. I think it makes you, the more you experience, um, it makes you a better candidate for a job. It makes you a better boss. It makes you more interesting. It makes you happier. Um, and so I always tell young entrepreneurs, don't give away your 20s. You know, there's a lot of messages out there, 27 hours. I mean, work 23 hours and this, and that's, some, I, I, everybody knows you got to work hard. That, that's like, there's no secret sauce in hard work. I'm not saying you shunt. I'm just saying, don't give away your 20s. Don't sacrifice everything just for that. You can't get your 20s back. So 20s are a time to learn and experience and try different things and show up at different conferences and, net, and being here at, at this startup week and experience and taking as, in as much as you can. Your 30s and 40s are the time to cash in, to get really good at what it is you like to do and to cash in. And there is exceptions to that rule. So building your life resume to me is – being well-rounded success to me looks like it's not just being rich, man. I know a lot of people that I look at that I used to think are like my heroes. And then as I got older, they're like, they're just rich. Mm -hmm. I don't want, but I got, that's cool. I want that, but I don't want the other stuff that comes with what they're doing and the way they're treating people and everything. Success is being a good parent. It's being a good friend, being good at business, being healthy, being outdoors, you know, um, being well-rounded, be, having a, resp a social responsibility in this climate, you know, to, um, to, to what's going on. It's, it's, that's what success looks like. And, and that's what I mean by building your life resume. And one of the things I love, Jesse, is how you have taken action and put yourself in places, even though you didn't know what the end result would be. When you first met with David Goggins, you didn't know he'd be living with you for a month. When you went to Monterey, you didn't know you'd be buying all those muffins. But what can you speak to of that ability to take action without knowing the guarantee? How can that lead someone to their dreams? Yeah, I mean, I think I think you real they always say surround yourself with like-minded people and i always found it way more interesting to be around people that weren't like-minded but were interesting and you grow when you step into the unknown that's where growth happens and mm -hmm. so all, all of the success and failure and failure is a learning tool that i've received it's been when i go into places that I, I i just don't know what to expect it happened last week i was just in laguna beach and I was on a bike ride with this, uh, a bike coach. I'm training for a race called Ultraman 
which is part of one of the legs is a 264 mile bike ride. And I'm on this bike ride. We're going through the hills and I have no idea where we're going. I just know we're going for four hours. And I'm like, this is, I immediately, my brain went to, this is ridiculous. <laughs> I hate this. It went negative. That's never a good thing, by the way. And I surrendered to it about an hour and a half in. I'm like, look, you know, you're here for four hours. Then you're going to be eating smoothie bowls on your hotel couch. You can do this for four hours. So that was my first thing. Everything ends. And, um, and then I'm like, look, the fact that I don't know the unknown is it's a great thing. And let me see what this has to offer. Let me see what I'm going to, I'm only going to get better from it. Um, and just to build on that real quickly, when we started marquee jet, if they would have said to me, well, they did say to me, you're going to need FAA <laughs> approval. You're going to need department of transportation approval. You're going to have to raise money, build a team, get sales. You're going to need airplanes. <laughs> I'd, like, I'd be like FAA approval, deal. DOT apart. What are you talking? I was a kiddie pool attendant four years ago, man. What are you talking about? <laughs> you know, 99.999% of the people would be like, forget it. My approach on, on that and anything like that, so as small as a bike ride to as big as starting a company, what's the first thing you said I had to do? I need what? Mm -hmm. Department of transportation approval. Okay. Let me get a lawyer that knows about that. And once that happened, what was the second thing I need to do? F you start to chop down the cherry tree one bite at a time. You know, and, and that's the, the, the entrepreneurial approach. There's going to be major obstacles along the way. You have to want it. Your want and desire has to be bigger than the obstacles. If the obstacles are bigger, if the, if the obstacles are bigger than how much you want it, they're going to win. If you want it more than the obstacles, they're insignificant. And you, you, you know, you're going to come across these obstacles and you just attack them one at a time and you keep moving forward, constant forward motion. And until you get to your goal, you just keep going, you move back, you keep charging, move back, keep charging. And you have to just be, you know, relentless with it until you get to your, to the goal period. Well, and Jesse, I've heard this. Many of us NFL players have heard this about you, ultra marathon professional athletes. That may mean even if you crap yourself while running. I mean, has that happened to you? We hear that happens to all the ultra marathon <laughs> runners. How do you how do you push through that? Well, I've never I've never experienced that personally. I've seen it happen many <laughs> times, but I've been in race. I have been in races where I've had you know many many toenails floating around in my shoe oh. and man, many bad uh, moments. But it's the same thing. It's the, the people that finish a 100-mile race versus the people that don't. They come down to really a, just a couple of things. And one of the biggest things, and it's relatable to business, is when you get to 38, 48, 50 miles, 60 miles, and you're really hurting, just like when you get to a point in business where you don't think you can keep going anymore, the ones that, be like, that say, oh, this is too hard, I'm going to be here forever, I can't go on, they quit. The ones that say, well, if I keep moving forward, if I could just go another five miles, maybe I'll feel better. And let me just go 10 miles and keep going and maybe something, maybe luck will find me. Maybe I'll get a sale. Maybe I'll get a referral. If they always have that attitude, they never stop. And all of a sudden they're at mile 80 and they're like, well, I only have 20 miles left. If I'm an entrepreneur and I never stop, eventually, most, most of the times, until you've exhausted all your resources, luck will find you. A sale will find you. So I just, that's the difference maker. Jesse, uh, you said entrepreneurs never stop. And uh, I 100% believe that. Um, but developing that mindset uh, is, is a lot harder uh, than, than, than easy said and easy explained as you've explained it. When you think about mindset and you think about developing uh, that real winning growth mindset, what are tips and tricks for the audience just to be able to get yourself in that mindset consistently and stay there? Yeah, it is completely self-talk. It's, mm. it's 100% self, I wanna say 100%, but all these books and everything with all these different things and principles and do this, it comes down to self-talk. If you tell you, nice. yourself, I'm never gonna get this, and you actually, um, talk about it and give it power and speak it, it's never going to happen. And I've always been able to maintain real good dialogue internally. That doesn't mean I don't have doubt. Doesn't mean I don't have fear. Doesn't mean that I don't, I don't question myself, but I've always been able to be like, 
you know, even on this bike ride, man, the, the, there's two things that could happen. At one point I said to myself, Jesse, whatever you do, we're going up this crazy steep hill. I said, whatever you do, don't get off the bike and walk it up the hill like an eight-year-old. <laughs> I don't care if your heart explodes, just go, keep going. And um, all that, that, that didn't come with training. That's just self-talk and conviction. And it comes down to like what I said, wanting it more. That's the silver bullet, you know? And it sounds ridiculously obvious. It sounds, it might sound hokey, but if you're not, if you're, I can tell you this, if you're telling yourself, I'm not good enough, I don't have enough experience, I don't even know where to start, this isn't what I'm good at, I'm not good at sales, that's not my strong suit, you're never gonna be good at it. The, the bet, a very simple correction would be, I'm gonna get much better at sales. I'm gonna learn how to get better at sales. I'm gonna learn, I'm gonna you know, be persistent enough to, you know, when I, here you go, when I, when I started out in business, again, I wasn't, it wasn't like I was homeless, but I was couch to couch. And I walked in, I would walk into my office with my partner and I would say every day, Kenny, we're millionaires, man. <laughs> we're millionaires. They just haven't paid us yet. <laughs> that was the mindset. And, you know, you don't need to read a book to do that. Just be mindful of the words that you say. We love it. We love it. We're going to get to some uh, questions from the audience here in, in right after this. But Jesse, I mean, if you're looking at one area, you're talking to your 27 year old self right now. What are two areas which you think, hey, maybe there's some ability here to hack some efficiency, healthcare, education. What are a couple of the areas you see right now where you say, you know what, there's opportunity. You know, I think that I think that the narrow because of the state of where we are right now. And look, this might have been a live event a year ago, now it's a virtual event. I think everything is changing. And, and with change comes amazing opportunity. The people that think outside of the box right now change the narrative in any industry are gonna be at a big advantage. You don't even need inventory anymore. With mm. Zoom and all these different things going on, I mean, you can reach people at the click of a button. Everybody here that's, that's in the chat room, the, you know, the people that are listening have access to a computer you can start a business on a shoestring right now. So I always ask myself if I was born, I was born in a different era. I was knocking on people's doors, man, trying to get them to buy shrimp. I don't even eat shellfish. Um, I, you know, I was born in a different era. I was born in this era, you know, the handshake era and um, not the email era. So I always ask myself, what I, how would I survive in today's climate, if I was 25, 26 years old, you know? And I think a lot of the principles in the short amount of time that we talked about would hold, would hold steady. Being consistent, reaching out to three to 10 people every day and building my network, having really good positive self-talk, owning the meeting when I walk in, strategies to be effective, staying connected to people, um, not seeking validation when I'm, when I'm have an idea, mm -hmm. you, you know, all the things we, we covered a lot, man. And what, 20 minutes, this is like, we, you, I could probably make a list if I rewatch this tape of 10, <laughs> 15 things that I would do regardless if I'm 27 or 50, regardless if we're in an era of technology or not. Awesome. Awesome. Well, we're getting a couple of questions from the crowd right there on the Zoom. And thank you, everybody, for coming. The Pittsburgh Steelers say every morning the first rule in getting better is showing up. And you did that already today. So thank and thank you, Jesse, for so much of the insight. While we get a couple of those questions real quick, you talked about distractions. How have you been able to recognize distractions when you are working or when you are spending that time and being present with your family? Yeah, I mean, for starters, I try not to schedule distractions. So a lot of us mm. schedule, you know, like fake meetings, just to add an obligation or whatever, and that takes a lot of our time. Um, so what's that email look like? You're like, hey, actually, I don't want to do this meeting, or are you kind of gentler about it, or how do you, no. not, or just not even put them on? <clears throat> a lot of people are scared to say no to things, and I think saying no is a tremendous opportunity. If I get invited to your wedding, and I don't want to fly all the way to LA for the wedding, yeah. right? Um, now I might say I can't go. I'm sorry, and have a lot of guilt. Um, but I don't. I don't. First of all, I go to the important ones. I show up. 
all the time, but you can't show up for everything. But, you know, that doesn't mean you can't send a note the night before. Hey, guys, thinking about you. So sorry we can't be there. A bottle of champagne. If I can't go to a dinner meeting. No, I can't go, guys. I, I can't go to dinner tonight. Doesn't mean I can't call the restaurant and send a bottle of wine and be a better hero mm. and even being at the meeting. My point is it presents opportunity the way you say no to even get more out of it than if you said yes. So I say no to those things. I try. Look, you have to remember also. This isn't a fair conversation because I'm 52. I'm in a different chapter of my life. Um, I'm not struggling check to check. So it's right. easy for me to say, uh, to, 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 to say this. But um, in your 20s and 30s, it's a, you really do have to say yes to everything. I don't mm -hmm. want to retrade what I said, but I did go to all those meetings and I laughed at jokes that weren't funny and I showed up at conferences <laughs> and I wanted the sale and I wanted to be, you know, but in your forties and fifties, man, that's a great time to say no. So we've got some uh, questions from the audience. And uh, the first one is sounds like you say, here's my goal. And you hold through it at all odds through torrential storms. What does your team value most about you? Um, well, I would hope that they would say our relationship. <laughs> I would hope that they would say that, you know, uh, just the personal working relationship. Um, I'd have to ask them. I, I don't know. But I mean, I try to, you know, I try to lead by example. They know my, I have a small team right now. They know my schedule. I'm very open about my days, my time, what I do, my priorities. I communicate. You know, you, you said something a, a minute ago. Um, you were saying, oh, yeah, my, my kids know it's football time, time to go to work. What you did by saying that is you're telling them, I'm going to work, I have to do that. And when you say that, you take away the guilt. Because mm -hmm. if you don't communicate, like I'm out of balance or I'm doing this or I'm working really hard with your partner, you're always gonna, it could be, it could lead to guilt on your side and resentment on their side, you know? So if just by communicating, hey guys, I'm taking three days off, I'm doing this. People wanna be heard. They want to be communicated with. So with my team, I try to have a real open dialogue and let them know the communication's open. You guys have ideas, share them with me. You know, I want to give people a voice. Jesse, you are a husband to one, father to four. Hear from the audience. Uh, as a parent, how do you instill an entrepreneur's mindset on your kids? Great question. Um, First of all, you have to make sure they want to be an entrepreneur. Not everybody wants that and everybody's on their own journey. So I think part of being a parent, uh, the hard part for me is recognizing my kid's journey is different than mine. If I like mm. to play basketball till midnight outside every day, uh, but my kids want to come and play Minecraft or Fortnite every day, I can't be mad at them. You know, they're, they're on a different journey than me. So I have to make sure that they, they want to be an entrepreneur. Um, but listen, I... I think the number one thing parents can do in that regard is praise the effort. And that doesn't mean for an entrepreneur, it's for an athlete, anybody. Instead of praising the result, the success or the failure, praise the effort. For example, I loved watching you guys swim today. I loved watching how hard you worked at, at basketball practice today. Not, man, you scored 30 points, man. You, you were the star. I mm. loved watching how hard you worked. All that hard work this week paid off. You know, this is a result of all the hard work that you put in. I love watching you try. It's so inspiring to me to see, you, you know, give your all when you're out on the field. That dialogue is creating a mindset for an entrepreneur because it's, it's about trying. Jesse, uh, it's been known that you are a rapper. Question from the audience is uh, <laughs> what's on your playlist? <laughs> Man, I'm stuck in the 80s and 90s. I'm, I'm stuck in the 80s hip hop still. So I'm still That's amazing. run DMC, rock him, New York based hip hop. Yeah. Nas, you got any my guy Nas? I'm a Nas, Nas. guy, Jesse. Yeah, yeah of course. Hey, Rewind might be the greatest song ever made. I mean, he did it entirely backwards. What was your what was your kind of style when you were uh, spitting on the mic, though? <laughs> oh, man. I, you know, I wrote my album in 1989 when I was in college. I was a senior. So it was more like frat rap, you know, but I was a Will, I was a Will Smith fan. I was, yeah. I was a Dana Dane fan. I was into like the, all the storytelling, you know, rappers, Slick Rick. Yep. 
Listen only on your other story to tell. I mean, yeah, Slick I, Rick, come on, Jesse. They get you better than that. And I'm still a fan of all those guys. In fact, I got Rick on my wall right here. There he nice. Goes. Yeah. Heck yeah. And rightfully where he belongs. Another Amazing. question from the crowd, Jesse. What's something that's happened in your life recently that's brought you a lot of joy? Well, you know, most of it now, um, I love being outside. Uh, I'm learning how to swim. I, I get a lot of joy watching my kids, playing with my kids, being around my kids. Um, and I made a list when I turned 50 of 50 things that I always wanted to learn but never did, had a free dive, backgammon, uh, ride a motorcycle, ballroom dance. And I've brought in instructors to teach me, um, you know, week by week. So I, Gandhi has a, a great saying, learn like you'll live forever, live like you'll die tomorrow. And I've, I've kind of been, I've really taken that to heart. Just really been learning a lot, man, as I get older, continuing to learn, but living, I live big. And I don't mean big like Rolls Royce big. Um, I mean, I live big, adventure big. I spend a lot of time. Big. Yeah, 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 100 <laughs> miles big. So, so, so Jesse, when you uh, wanted to get better at swimming, it sounds like you worked out with an Olympian. Uh, it, what was the small adjustments that you learned that just made you that much better? Oh, my God. You know, it's so interesting. Um, I don't See, I won't even say I'm a terrible swimmer. Cause I won't even give it that much. I won't even put it out there. So I'm a work in progress. I'm getting better at my swimming. Uh, Positive self-talk. But here, here, right. That's what I'm saying. I could easily say I'm a terrible swimmer. Why would I say that? Now I'm telling my whole body when I go in the pool, I'm a terrible swimmer. I'm not going to say that I'm a work in progress. I've gotten so much better, but what's interesting is little things. So this might, this might sound insignificant. And if you're not a swimmer, who cares, but it's totally significant no matter what you do. I've been raising my head up a little bit. Your head is the heaviest part of your body. So if you raise your head up, your hips sink naturally, and then you create drag and it really slows you down. So just by making a minor adjustment by keeping my head down, I've raised my body and my hips and I become way more efficient. It's just physics. And it's true of everything. Sometimes just making a slight shift in your email, how you communicate, what you're doing, you might be in the exact right space, but just a little bit off course. You know, if I put a sailboat and I fly to London and my rudder's off by just, you know, three inches, I'm going to end up in Africa. Mm -hmm. So you might, you could just be off course just a little bit and in the right space and not even realize that, you know, that, wow, I'm in the right lane. I'm just a little bit off. And, and, and that's what, what, what I learned from my swim instructor. You know, Jesse, I think a lot of people right now with the social consciousness, the death of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, are looking for small adjustments to make in their lives outside of business. How has is, how is the latest social consciousness changed you or made you change a couple of things you've done? Yeah, I mean, I spent a lot of time talking to my friends, um, learning as much as I can, um, just being even more aware and... Um, you know, trying to do my part, which is hard because you, a lot of people I think say, well, what can one person do or how do I get involved and how do I help? And I think it starts with education. Like, but I, I mean, real, really educating yourself on a lot of different things. So I started my journey there and, um, and it's never ending for me, you know, and I hope it's never ending for everybody. We're coming up towards our end here. Uh, Jesse, tell us what's next. Uh, you're, you're deep in building your brand, giving back, uh, and really helping entrepreneurs all over the world be better uh, at, at what they do. Uh, what's, what's next on deck for Jesse Insler? Well, you know, I'm, I just started this thing called 30 Days of Excellence. I do every Wednesday night with my friend Chad Wright, who's a Navy SEAL, and my friend Mark Brown, who played in the NFL. And we just do an open forum conversation. Um, and I really enjoy that. It's called 30 Days of Excellence on my Instagram. Um, but also, I found a loophole in the NCA rules. And um, I realized that I have eligibility to row. Yeah, I actually have eligibility to row crew. Let's so do it. Yeah, man. I'm thinking about going back and, and trying to make a college crew team. Just don't do it at USC, right? I mean, you millionaires going back to USC, it's been a bit of an issue lately. Come on I don't over think to Notre I, Dame, Jesse. Listen, I don't, think I, could, I don't think I have the grades to get into uh, SC these days. So yeah. I have to go, you know, notch it down a little bit. 
<laughs> well, he is Jesse Itzler. Jesse, thank you so much for all your time. Congratulations on all your success. And we really appreciate the impact you're giving by spending time with us today. Thank you. Oh, my thanks, pleasure, Jesse. guys. Yeah, thanks for having me, fellas. Well, stay tuned and make sure to look at the other sessions, panels, and keynotes that will affect your life. There's over 250 this year at Denver Startup Week, so enjoy. I'm Tammy Dorr, President and CEO of the Downtown Denver Partnership and co-founder of Denver Startup Week. This week is so important. It's important for us to come together and think big and boldly about our future, to dream and have visions for companies. These companies that are built today will be our economic strength, our economic drivers, and our economic saviors for the future of both our region, our state, and our country. We don't take it lightly. Come together during this week and make things happen. Before we dive in, we want to say a special thank you to our 2020 Denver Startup Week sponsors who make it all possible. Thanks to our title sponsors, Downtown Denver Partnership, J.P. Morgan Chase, Prologis, and Zero, and our track sponsors who have made all of the great content you're hearing today possible: Battery 621 and The Public Works. Capital One Cafe, Colorado Lending Source, Friday Help, Quizlet, Exactly, Zayo, and Zestful. Our headline event sponsors are bringing the excitement to all of you this week. Thank you to Wix, Kenzen, MAPR Agency, Obsidian HR, Kickstart Fund, Promontory Mortgage, Molson Coors, and Comcast. Finally, thank you to our partner and member sponsors. They're all listed on the screen. Thank you for your support of Denver Startup Week. Now, make things happen.